Coming soon to own on video and DVD. Did that make you feel something? You're probably on the verge of tears, longing for your childhood. Wah! Wah! Nostalgia is a funny thing. In fact, it's so funny that corporations are profiting billions of dollars a year off of you going, Ooh, I love The Lion King. That was my favorite movie as a kid. And I'm gonna go see the remake even though it looks exactly the same as the original, but worse. The monetary profit of nostalgia is why things like vinyls, Polaroids, bell-bottom jeans are coming back. And it's also why sports teams throw a retro night with uniforms that almost always look better than their awful usual ones. I mean, what is this? Are you the Cincinnati gray blobs? This video is sponsored by Established Titles, a word from Lady Gabby Balls in the next, I don't know, you'll see. Nostalgia is longing for a better, simpler time. Even if you had a traumatic childhood or have memories that weren't that great, you might be like me in that I still long for the summer days where I would spend 11 hours playing Maple Story and feeling like an absolute champ afterwards. But to really understand why nostalgia is so profitable and why we love that sh so much we eat it up like mac and cheese <laughs> we have to understand the true blood definition of nostalgia. Nostalgia is a sentimental men or women to pump me up. Nostalgia is a sentimental longing or wistful affection for the past, typically for a period or place with happy personal who cares? We all know what nostalgia is. <laughs> But what about nostalgia for a time and place that you didn't even live in, huh? What about that? I'm looking at you, Gen Zers, people on, on TikTok. What is this hair? You were born in 2003, not 1993. And you didn't have to endure the pain of skinny jeans being in style. I'm so jealous. Half of you didn't even have vinyls until Tumblr made it cool again in 20. 12? 13? What is this? 1960? Or all these comments on this Japanese city pop compilation? Music from the 80s, 90s Japan? We didn't live in that time or place. What the hell are you nostalgic for? Well, nostalgia for a time beyond our own is actually a funny phenomenon called anemoya. Not to be confused with the lack of red blood cells or houses for clownfish. And you want to know why this happens? Because nostalgia isn't real. Nostalgia has long been known not to represent the actual past, but rather the past as we imagine it. It is a fantasy, plain and simple. Its yearnings are not for times we really experienced, but for times we'd like to think we experienced. This makes sense when taken into a personal context. We tend to see our own early years as more idyllic than they really were. Which explains why even if your childhood kinda sucked, you still feel some type of warm feeling when you hear this. Uh, existential crisis aside, let's dive into the many profitabilities of nostalgia and why it happens. Because although nostalgia is basically an aesthetic for a lot of us, right under our noses, it's actually making a bunch of rich people even richer. Nostalgia in movies and TV shows is why we rewatch a lot of shit. It's also just comforting to know what happens already. It's why people make Friends or The Office their entire personality because they watched it a lot when they were younger. Nostalgia is the same reason that everyone thinks the SNL that they grew up with was the best era, even though it was all the same shit all along. But in recent years, companies saw this shift happen where we reach for older media and they saw dollar signs and Shrek 2. The remake era has slowed down a bit, but remember when Disney was pumping out remakes of everyone's favorite childhood movies? And they were all just a bit worse than the originals. Except for Aladdin. The song was so good. I won't be quiet. Oh, you go, Jasmine. You girl boss your way to the top. That's right. Disney has a lot of animated classics, but also a lot of forgotten flops. So it's obvious to see why they chose to create live action remakes of only the most profitable and successful Disney classics. Duh, right? But it just proves that money is the driving force for all of this. Compare this to She-Hulk, the comic book series that only Marvel nerds know and also did horribly on the big screen. This was definitely a passion project and it shows. Some of you at this point
point might be thinking, well, what about the live action remake of Mulan? Mulan is extremely popular, yet the remake flopped. And to that, well, I'm sure that there are exceptions to this rule. The live action remake of Mulan went right to streaming platforms in the middle of the pandemic, not to mention the surrounding controversy before the movie even dropped. So I really think if the Mulan live action remake was released in theaters during a normal period of time, I still think it would have smashed the box office in profits, even if the movie was bad. With money as the driving factor, let's make a few comparisons, shall we? Luckily, a student at Pratt Institute already painstakingly made these graphs for me, so I'm going to use their data. Thank you, Katie. Here are some audience scores of the originals versus the remakes. As you can see, every single original film is rated higher by the audience and critics in terms of just quality score, whether or not they liked the dang movie or not, except for audience scores of Aladdin <laughs> and The Jungle <laughs> Book, only by a margin. So it's safe to say that overall, the original movies were better than the live action remakes. Um, but then, um, then there are the profits. Holy sh! Look at how much money these remakes make. I mean, this is jarring. Although it is important to note that the Lady and the Tramp and Mulan remakes went right to streaming only because of the P word of 2020. So keep that in mind throughout this data, but I mean, it's no competition. Nostalgia sells. Say it with me, folks. Even if the rating is <laughs> the money is still I know I've been talking about Disney for this whole section, but I only use them because it's the best clear-cut example of nostalgia being a driving factor for the movie's performance in the box office. Money flying right out of your pockets into the hands of Disney for a mediocre movie experience. Oh, oh, here you go. Oh, here, you want more money? You want my money? Yes, please. I want animated animals. Please, please, thank you. There are other examples of this, like Top Gun, but the new one actually did better than the original in every way possible, which is great. But hey, my point still stands. Would Top Gun have performed this well if it was its own standing original movie? Or was it the nostalgia that got everyone into the theater and the movie actually being good was a nice plus, boosting the numbers just a bit more? Either way, the nostalgia still sells because look at those frickin' numbers. Here's another big example. Star Wars. Safe to say that Star Wars fans have been riding the nostalgia dick since 1999. The original Star Wars trilogy dropped in the 70s, and the prequels were long awaited by the time they came out in 1999, and so on. And those prequels had really, really mixed reviews. I don't like sand. Yet made 800 million more dollars than the original frickin' trilogy in theaters. Even better yet, the sequels, 7, 8, and 9, squashed both the prequels and the original trilogy in box office sales, making over four billion dollars for this. And if you're wondering about the scores, the audience and critic scores of the Star Wars main movies are kind of all over the place, but generally the trend goes like this, with the original trilogy performing the best, then the sequels, and then lastly the prequels at the bottom. But the profitability of each set of trilogies, bars, tells a different story. Now there is something to be said here about the nuance of if the remake is actually good, does this then take away the label of cash grab or the fact that the company is just remaking the property for the money? Because we seem to really only focus on the remakes that are bad in doing this, and I am not smart enough to continue commenting on it. Another honorable mention is the Halo TV show, in which the only thing going for it was the fact that it used the Halo franchise name, while not being true to the source material material at all. In fact, the writers for the show prided themselves on not being knowledgeable on the Halo games, which is like, why not just make your own original TV series then? Without Halo! Because that sh doesn't sell. This is a blatant example of the industry just profiting off of a recognizable name and profiting off of Halo fans. I knew so many people who just hate watched the show because they were Halo fans and nothing else. But it still increased Paramount Plus's revenue by 148%, cashing in $585 million for the studio studio for the quarter, which is why they're still gonna make season two. It's all about brand recognition, baby. That's why they're making too many Star Wars shows to keep up with. Which brings me to talk about
Nostalgia in video games is something that I've seen a lot of people talk about, but really only with specific games or consoles, but never as a whole and how it affects us and our pockets. Lady Balls, I have some important news to share with you. I'm literally in the middle of talking about video games. I, I know, but it's important. It's about the thing. Why do you always do this? Can't you see that I'm busy? Why can't you literally just I come back just this after one I'm time done filming? I'm not I understanding you why, to hear this. why you it's have important. to come, Please come come yelling at me. I get really anxious that I'm and I want to cry something. I'm literally because I can't so busy. I'm the most important please, person in the Ms. world. Balls, why can't you just I, see that? Lady Balls, and please calm wait until down. the end. Wait. Did you call me Lady Gabby Bell? Yes, I did. And you too can become a lord or lady using the sponsor of today's video, Established Titles. I like it. Yes, this is completely real, too. In becoming a laird, you can put Lord your name on a credit card, even a plane ticket, or a dating profile. If I saw Lord Matthew on Tinder, I would be inclined to swipe right. What Established Titles does is they give you a one square foot plot of land in Scotland, which by Scottish historic custom, officially makes you a laird as a landowner in Scotland. Established Titles is a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global reforestation efforts. They plant a tree with every order and work with global charities, one tree planted and trees for the future. It's a great gift for friends and family. And the first 200 people to purchase a title pack using my link will be effectively next to my plot. Within a few minutes walking distance, and depending on how many of you use my link, we can make our own little gatekeeper kingdom in our own area. We can take over. <laughs> Established Titles is actually running a Black Friday sale. Plus, if you use the code Gabby Bell, you get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash Gabby Bell to get your gifts now and help support the channel. Make sure you check them out and help support the channel and become a lead today. So have you ever been sitting doing nothing in your apartment when you get a nice hit of nostalgia and go, I'd love to play some Wind Waker right now. I'd love to play Wind Waker right now. So you hop online ready to spend your hard earned adult money on a 20 year old game only to find out it's being sold for this much. Why is it this expensive? And then you go down this rabbit hole. Majora's Mask, way too much money. Ocarina of Time, way too much money. And I have it. Why are these old ass games so much money? Well, I actually have somewhat of an answer for that. So part of it being is that a lot of these old N64 games are now collector's items, which is why you see the golden Ocarina of Time and golden Majora's Mask cartridges being sold for so much money. So while you can still get the gray normal cartridges for a reasonable price, a lot of these sellers are unreliable. You don't know if it really works. And sometimes they can just be a bit hard to find, which makes them even more desirable and sought after. Also jarring but makes you put things into perspective is that the original sticker prices for Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and other hit titles on the N64 sold for $60 back in the day, which if you put that into an inflation calculator is over $100 in today's money. So it's jarring for a normal person to go search for an N64 game they used to like and find that it's still $50, which might seem like the same price but really is less than it was being sold back in the late 90s. 90s when you account for inflation. So the whole thing is nuanced. For example, trying to find any type of disc for Wind Waker is nearly impossible and GameCube games sold for $50 retail back in the day and finding any good copy of Wind Waker is going to be over like $75, which is actually the exact same amount as $50 in 2002, if you count for inflation. $50 in 2002 is the same as $82 today. So it's still roughly the same price, which is crazy for the game being like 20 years old. But still doesn't take away the fact that spending $60 on a used beat up cartridge from 22 years ago at least. How, how old am I? From like okay, from like 25 years ago uh, can seem like a lot more money than it should be. So I think I'm still making a point here. Please don't beat me up. I have a lot of retro games and guess what? I almost never play them. Why do I hang on to them? It's the emotional attachment. I can't let go of Chrono Cross, the most underrated JRPG of all time. I walked into Best Buy the other day during my one outing that I actually leave my home per month and I saw sitting next to the OLED Nintendo Switch, a Game & Watch handheld system. 
selling for $50. Did you know they started making this shit again? This thing plays one game and you're gonna spend $50 on it? Okay, I know that games these days are $60 retail price, but I'm saying this thing plays one game and the game is from like 50 years ago and you can literally get it for free on the Switch. And I guess what I'm realizing here is that just because a movie or game is old doesn't mean the price will go down because as soon as that thing is considered vintage and sought after again, the price goes just back up to what it was before. And I know that's just from the basics of supply and demand, but also says something about the value of an older product if it's good and stands the test of time. I'd bet most of you watching don't even know what a Game & Watch is, besides the annoying Smash character. I, I like that, and of course back here. The Game & Watch is a handheld console originally released in 1980 and has been re-released with a color screen in 2020 to 2021. I don't know why they gave me a range. The Game & Watch saw the first worldwide success for Nintendo, selling 43.4 million copies. So I guess it makes sense why they're re-releasing this sh Is it even making money? I couldn't find an exact number when I was writing this, but I bet if they decided that it was a good business decision to re-release these 40-year-old gaming consoles that they're probably turning a profit on it. Cause oh my god, there's no way this sh** is $50 to make. <laughs> these things are like notoriously simple. They're so simple inside. So let's get down to the bottom of it. Why would you spend $50 on a handheld thing that only plays one game when you can emulate the game you want for free on a laptop or computer? I have never done this, okay? I've never, I've never emulated a game, okay? I I, it was just a hypothetical nostalgia. Remember this game? Red Dead Redemption 1 sold eight and a half million copies in its first year. And the sequel, which was actually a prequel, it's kind of like Star Wars, <laughs> sold over 42 million copies. Try not to get so excited about the numbers. I feel like I'm just yelling all the numbers. It sold over 42 million copies and had the second largest opening weekend, making $725 million in sales just from its opening weekend and exceeded the lifetime sales of Red Dead Redemption 1 in just two weeks. I had a goddamn plan! Not to mention, it definitely helped boost sales of the first original game, launching that one up to 23 million copies sold. Don't get me wrong, I love this game. I learned how to play poker from this game. But would it have marketed so well and gained all that hype if not for the nostalgia of its predecessor and the remembrance of the first one just being a good game and wanting to hopefully rediscover that feeling in the sequel. Oh. <laughs> Imagine the long-awaited sequel prequel to a game that came out in 2010 when you were a stinky Dorito-eating little middle school boy. When you were at the height of your middle school years. Prime development for nostalgia. Heck, that's why I bought Far Cry 3 again and have replayed it so many times. It's not only a good game, but reliving some old memories is just a nice feeling. Fuck you! Okay? You! Okay. This type of feeling where we're always chasing the past is part of the reason people are Gen 1ers and only think the original 151 Pokemon are the best ones. <laughs> and why so many people's favorite Zelda game is the one that they played as a kid, Ocarina of Time. And why they say that Breath of the Wild's music isn't that good, okay? Maybe I have a personal vendetta against that, but Breath of the Wild's music is phenomenal and I think you're just blinded by nostalgia. Where nothing can be as good as the original thing that you played as a kid because it has personal meaning to you. Is the reason the original box sets of Pokemon cards sell for way too much money. This box costs $30,000. It's why we watch other people open them and why a GameCube is way too much money. Oh my God, mom, why did you let me give my GameCube to GameStop so I could buy a Wii? God, no. Why does this happen? Now I have money, a place to live, and I can do whatever I want as a young adult. But yet I still chase the feeling of childhood in so many ways. I mainly do this through video games, but it can be different for every person. It's the same reason I and so many others have gotten back into Roller Coaster Tycoon. It's why I still log into MapleStory every now and again, only to be disappointed at how much it's changed for the worse. God, will she ever stop complaining about MapleStory? My god. It's why we love Minecraft so much, which is a game that even leans into the nostalgic art style, leaving your parents asking, why does it look like that? Is it supposed to look like that? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna explode now. 
It's why Jagex decided to make Old School RuneScape its own standalone thing, and why so many people still play it regularly. Same with World of Warcraft Classic, probably. I don't know, nerds. Not to take away from how good these older games really are, but I can't help but feel like nostalgia is a big part of why we want to play them again, on top of the fact that sometimes the old sh** is just better. But what about when it's not better? Because a lot of the time now, when I launch an older game like Plants vs. Zombies, Zombies, Maple Story, Pokemon Channel, I only find myself playing for a couple hours or binging it for a short period of time before I put it down again and say, huh. That was nice. It's almost always better in my head in the memories than it really was. Have you actually tried playing the original Animal Crossing again? As much as I loved it as a kid, I couldn't get back into it. I log in for the nostalgia and then check out, except for Roller Coaster Tycoon, because I've been binging that for months now. Anyway, there's a huge price tag on older games and consoles now, and I'm declaring the big reason being nostalgia. Let me ask you a question. Who do you see driving around those old 50s classic cars around town? It's Grandpa. He fought in World War II. And who do you see buying up the 80s and 90s cars these days? People in their mid-20s to 30s. There's a reason that happens. Nostalgia. Older, discontinued car models are brought back with the same name, even though it's a completely different car. Like, what is this? This isn't even the same sh**. It's blatantly obvious that you're just using the name to sell the car. It's soulless. And then we have an actual good example being the Bronco that got brought back for a second chance at life. And it, it actually looks good. I think, I think that looks good. Hey, it looks good. It looks pretty good. You may have noticed by now that the amount of companies profiting off of nostalgia spans a across almost every industry. Photography, music, movies, TV, video games, and all of them have some soulless megacorp cash grabs in them. And some are actual passion projects by people who really care about the property and genuinely want to revive an old thing. So it's easy to focus on the soulless corporation, but even with the passion projects, money is still being made off of our little brains going, ooh, Look at this old thing. I love this old thing. Here's an honorable mention to Y2K fashion coming back. Once again, please no skinny jeans. I'm begging you not to bring skinny jeans back in style. It's all over Pinterest. Old cars, fashion, celebrity couples, and fashion. I wrote fashion twice on the script and I'm leaving it in. It's all an aesthetic that goes beyond paying for an experience like movies and games, but also actual sh Merchandising. There's a word for it. It's not just sh You know what? Yeah. Let's talk about music. Taylor Swift has been dominating the vinyls. My dude, you're selling four different vinyls of the same album so that tweens can make a clock? Why? Because vinyls are profitable to sell now and there's limited distributors or whatever, li limited people who make the vinyls. I don't know how it works. It's an aesthetic to have vinyls. You think people own vinyls because the music quality is better? No, it's all for the look. I don't even own a vinyl player. A record player. What's it called? It's all for the look and feel. To feel like you're some deep indie kid on Tumblr or some sh**. Who cares? It's cool to do throwback now. Also, I'd like to clarify that all my vinyls were gifts. Okay, I didn't go out of my way to buy this and I don't even have a record player, okay? Calm down. I want to sell a vinyl of my song Plastic Love because I think it would be cool to call back to the original 1984 song, oh my god. God, I'm perpetuating the thing that I'm talking about. Okay, but we can use that as an example, right? My song, Plastic Love, is the best performing song I've ever released in terms of stats, uh, performance, whatever. Like, it, they're big number, yeah? And I'm willing to bet that a lot of that attention on that song has come from people who enjoy the original 1984 song called Plastic Love. The song that it's based off of. I did the thing. I did a, I did a remake. I did a reboot. I'm literally exposing myself right now. Not, not really. YouTube, calm down. I'm not, no, that's not what I meant. City Pop making a comeback, uh, this time worldwide, is a prime example of this nostalgia. There's nostalgia in music so much these days that artists like Dua Lipa and Charlie Puth have leaned heavily into this nostalgic sound. And Silk Sonic, actually. Why didn't I put that in the script? What am I doing? And hey, I eat it up. It's not necessarily a bad thing. None of this is. As long as we're enjoying it, right? Older synths, retro audio equipment is still being sold.
sold because people still want to buy that original sound to get as close to the 80s as we possibly can, Elton John, you're everywhere now. Recording music with old ass audio equipment is becoming popular and sought after again in the music industry. So much so that an example is Taylor Swift's album Lover had songs that purposefully used instruments invented before 1970 to really get that feel that they were going for. The feeling of... Nostalgia. Good job. Producers wanting this sound will also use analog, original versions of compressors, EQs. Did you know that sh Like they used to be physical? Like, I, <laughs> there's someone out there that didn't know that, okay? Your plugins, some of those plugins are based on like real things. Like a box that did, that did the thing. I won't nerd out about that in this video, but just know that people will buy older sh now just to do that just to do it. Nostalgia is why pop punk is making a comeback, whether or not you think that's good or bad. It's why former pop artists have turned to surface level pop punk. Honestly, some of that shit feels soulless. But that's neither here nor there. Or over there. It's the reason Avril Lavigne is coming back into the spotlight. And even besides capturing that old sound, there are even songs about nostalgia. Yeah, it never ends. I mean, is it a little cringy? Yeah. Did it perform really well on the charts and is one of Anne Marie's most popular songs? Also, yeah. But the point is that in capturing that old sound, and as much as the record labels have a stranglehold on the radio play of music, it's still clear that the nostalgic sound of old music is still dominating today's charts. It's all shit I can finally play for my mom without her getting mad at me. Look, mom, here's a song with Elton John. You like Elton John, right? Here you go. It has widespread appeal for people my age all the way up to kids in their 60s. It's no wonder nostalgia in music has been making a comeback in dominating the charts yet again as it takes advantage of taking us back to a simpler time that never really existed. And I didn't even get to mention lo-fi hip-hop. Lo-fi is literally rooted in making a song sound shittier for the aesthetic. Not to mention it's just gentrified boom bap of the 90s. Heavily inspired by artists like Jay Dilla and New Jabez, who are a big inspiration for the music on Adult Swim. We're coming full circle, you see? That's another reason why Adult Swim is so nostalgic to us, except for this f***ing terrifying meatball. Get this shit off my screen, it scared me as a kid. So all of this begs the question as to why? Why are we so obsessed with nostalgia these days? Only 90s kids remember this, and this, or this. <gasps> There's something warm about visiting your hometown after being away for college, yet you feel so out of place at the same time. Like you're visiting a liminal space, a time you can't touch anymore. You can't quite grasp it no matter what you do, where you go, or what you buy, and we're constantly chasing it. Is it because we long for the days as a child, where you had no responsibilities? Even if your childhood was traumatic, I still long for those peaceful summer days where I spend 11 hours playing MapleStory, and every time I hear the music, music back, it makes me want to cry. Wah, wah. Sometimes I sit there and smile for a minute as I boot the game back up, even though it's not even close to being the same game anymore. Are we adverse to change? Always longing for the good old days that sometimes weren't even that good? Nostalgia is a complex idea. Perhaps it's escapism, but corporations see dollar signs and often use nostalgia to capitalize on profits and to really tug on our heartstrings to sell us something. To sell us a feeling. Without them, even having to try to market it to us without having to come up with anything original. Is that even a bad thing if it's something we all want? I watched Spirited Away in theaters the other day. Even though I've seen the movie a dozen times, I still paid to go. But I still had a great time watching, eating popcorn and forbidden movie theater candy with friends. So does it even matter? Comment below. Okay, thanks. Subscribe. Bye.